Water is the most abundant resource on the planet. It's the only substance that we know of that comes in all three forms of solid, liquid, and gas. And yet we, the public, seem to know so little about it. It's the reason that you're alive. It's the reason why all life exists. There isn't an organism on this planet that doesn't require water in some way to survive. It's simultaneously one of the weirdest chemical compounds that we're aware of. But why? Why is water essential for life? Why does it look like this? Why, when you put a bottle of water in the freezer, does it explode? Why water? Water is composed of oxygen atoms and hydrogen atoms. Everyone knows that, but how these two chemical elements interact with one another is the most interesting part. Water is a hydride, which just means that it's a chemical compound composed of hydrogen and some other element, in this case, oxygen. But the boiling points of hydrides are weird. The general rule of thumb seems to be that the smaller the molecule, the lower the boiling point. Hydrogen telluride has a boiling point of minus four degrees. Hydrogen selenide has a boiling point of minus 42 degrees. Hydrogen sulfide, a boiling point of minus 62 degrees. And hydrogen oxide, water, has a boiling point of 100 degrees. This is weird, and not just by hydride standards, but for a whole host of other chemical compounds. And the reason for it is all thanks to hydrogen bonding. The same irregularity of water's high boiling point is also true of its freezing point as well. In contrast to other hydrides, water reacts very slowly to changes in its environment, something which is quite integral for life to exist at all. If water had the same relative difference in its boiling and freezing points as other hydrides, then a simple 20 degree drop would mean the difference between steam and ice, something which isn't particularly accommodating for organisms trying to make a living. But what are hydrogen bonds. Why do they exist and why do they form? Oxygen has six electrons and hydrogen has just one. So when the two hydrogen atoms bind to a oxygen atom, they form something called a covalent bond, where those two hydrogen electrons make a pair of electrons with two of the oxygen's electrons. So that leaves two non-bonding pairs of electrons left on the oxygen atom. Aside from the chemical element fluorine, oxygen is the most electronegative non-noble gas element. So the electrons that surround the oxygen are pulled more closely toward the nucleus than with less electronegative elements. These positive electrons repel the equally positively charged hydrogen atoms and push it further round the oxygen nucleus, creating something called a dipole. One end of the molecule is positively charged and the other end is negatively charged, like a molecular magnet. The polarized charges of the hydrogen and oxygen means that every molecule is pulled toward the other. The positive hydrogen attracts nearby negative oxygen atoms of other water molecules and vice versa. This connection or force between multiple molecules is called a hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bonds are the most fantastical property of water. It's what makes them the most unique molecule of the 15 million different chemical species that we're aware of. It's also the reason for something which is quite unusual, but we're all very aware of, why ice floats. The reason why water is liquid at room temperature is actually pretty simple. The higher thermal energy of the molecules means that they move around too fast for hydrogen bonds to be made effectively. The force provided by this thermal energy outweighs the attractive forces between molecules. But as the thermal energy lessens and the particles start to move around more slowly, more hydrogen bonds can be made such that they form into hexagonal lattice structures and form ice crystals. The bonds that connect the hydrogen and oxygen are a lot shorter than the hydrogen bonds themselves. So in a liquid form where less hydrogen bonds are made, the space between molecules is smaller, making it more dense. As the temperature cools and the molecules arrange themselves into these hexagonal lattices, the distance between each molecule becomes greater because the hydrogen bonds become more frequent. This is why when you freeze a bottle of water, it generally explodes. The space in between molecules has literally expanded thanks to the properties of hydrogen bonding and increased the water's volume by 9%. So, 
Because these hexagonal lattice structures form to create more space between molecules thanks to hydrogen bonding, the material is less dense and thus buoyant in water's liquid form. This is actually probably the most critical property of water that allows life to exist on this planet. If ice were denser than water, then lakes and oceans would freeze from bottom to top rather than top to bottom pretty much guaranteeing that you won't be able to do any ice skating, but also that all of the organisms that exist in that body of water would be dead. Hydrogen bonding is also responsible for the reason why water droplets look like this. At the centre of the solution of water, the molecules are being pulled in every direction thanks to these attractive forces by all of their surrounding neighbours and so the net force is zero. But on the surface of the liquid, the water molecules are only receiving a force on the half of them facing the centre. No forces are pulling them from above. Every molecule on the surface is trying to get to the centre, so the resulting effect is an attempt by all of the molecules to reduce the surface area of the liquid. And what geometric metric shape has the smallest ratio of surface area to volume, a sphere. Then as the water accumulates more water molecules, gravity and its weight start to drag it downwards and thus it forms the classic teardrop shape we're so accustomed to seeing. Basically, what I've just described is called surface tension, which is effectively how strong are the forces that attract molecules together in comparison to the forces that want to break them apart. The force that attracts molecules together is called cohesion and is exactly the reason why some bugs like the water strider can literally walk on water. So long as the force the bug is exerting on the surface of the water is less than the forces of cohesion, the tension in the water creates a flaw. And since the feet of the water strider are large and spread out, they move the downward weight given to them across a larger surface area, which in turn allows them to walk on water. You can actually do this at home by using a paperclip. If I take this paperclip here and just drop it in, it sinks, right? But if I carefully lower this into there, it floats. But watch what happens if I take a little cotton bud with some fairy liquid on it and just dip it in the solution. Soap molecules are made of long chains of hydrocarbons. At one end is a molecule which absolutely loves being in water, and at the other end, one that absolutely despises it. It is hydrophobic. So when the soap is dropped into the water, these two molecules separate, and the hydrophobic one tries its absolute hardest to worm its way up to the surface. As they find their way to the surface, they squeeze in between the molecules of water on the top, decreasing the surface tension of the water by roughly a third, unbalancing the cohesion so the paperclip sinks. This is exactly the reason you even use soap to begin with. In order to allow water to flow more easily into the tiny macroscopic cracks in your dishes or the fibers in your clothes or even the little tiny pores in your hands, you need to lower its surface tension. The materials or chemicals that are used to do this, like washing detergents or hand soap or even antiperspirant, are called surface active agents or surfactants. Surface tension and cohesion are also integral in your body, but they're only one half of the equation. On the one hand, we have how attracted molecules are to themselves, and on the other hand, we have how attracted they are to other different molecules. That force is called adhesion and is essential for your existence. As unintuitive as it might sound, water is very sticky. When you look outside after it's been raining, you'll see that some of the water is stuck to the glass. This is because some of the water molecules are more attracted to the glass than they are to themselves, and so they stick to it. This is also why when you put a glass tube in a body of water, it seems to climb up the glass tube even against the forces of gravity. Maybe you've seen something similar when using a straw. This phenomenon is called capillary action. The smaller the diameter of the tube, the more attractive the water molecules are because many more of them are in close proximity to the glass and so it climbs up further. This is essential for life for plants. This is how they allow water to climb up their xylem or equivalent blood vessels so that they can get the nutrients 
from not just the roots, but all the way to the tallest stems and the furthest leaves. The same thing is true of your blood. This is what allows your blood to move around your body against the pull of gravity more easily. Capillary action is the reason why damp forms in your house. It's the reason why if you put a napkin in a puddle of water, the water will climb up the napkin. It's how your tear ducts work. The water molecules are attracted to the molecules that make up their container, but they're also attracted to themselves. So as one is pulled up by the adhesive forces between the water molecule and the molecules of its container, the one behind follows thanks to the cohesive forces that are attracting the two molecules together. Which finally brings us on to you. You've probably heard that your body is made up of about 70% water. And whilst this is a nice statistic to hear, it doesn't seem to make that much sense. If we're 70% water, why are we not partly transparent? Why is a jellyfish partly transparent, but a cucumber isn't despite the fact that both of them have the same water contents of 95%? Well, it's all because water is the universal solvent. This is another fantastic property of water and the way that it bonds. Because of the dipole and the positive and negative forces that are acting on either end of the molecule, water attracts to itself, but it also attracts to other molecules, as I just explained with capillary action. But sometimes the forces that are present from this attraction are so strong that they can break apart the attractive forces between atoms in any given molecule. This is why you can dissolve salt in water. The two elements that make up a salt molecule, chlorine and sodium, are also polar, with negative and positive charges on either end of the molecule. Chlorine is negatively charged and sodium is positively charged, but the bonds that connect the sodium and chlorine atoms together aren't as strong as the covalent bonds that hold the oxygen and hydrogen together. Essentially, a molecular tug of war ensues with the water always winning the match, breaking apart the chlorine and sodium. The chlorine is strongly attracted to the hydrogen and the sodium wants to run toward the oxygen. And because the water's bonds are stronger, the salt molecule's bonds break first and run to them rather than the other way round. This is literally what the process of dissolving something is, the breaking of a molecule's bond to turn them into just atoms. Water is capable of dissolving more substances than any other liquid on Earth, which means that wherever water goes, it carries with it valuable chemicals, minerals, and nutrients. This same process is what our kidneys do. When we eat or drink things, we ingest potentially harmful substances into our bodies, which our kidneys filter out. Our bodies then rush water through our kidneys to break down these chemicals into their component atoms to make it more easy for us to get rid of them. The same thing also happens in the chemical exchanges within every cell of your body. This is why you are 70% water, but you don't look like water. You're not a puddle on the floor because most of the water in your body is housed within cell membranes. It's the same premise as filling a box with water kept inside plastic bags. The volume of the box is 90% water, but the water is not sloshing around and the box isn't transparent. Your lungs are 83% water. Your heart and your brain are 73% water. Even your bones are 31% water. Your sweat is almost 100% water, which is exactly why when you exercise, the weight that you lose isn't fat loss, it's water loss. When you breathe out, you lose about 237 milliliters of water every day, which is about this much. And a swimming pool loses about a thousand gallons of water a month due to evaporation. Most of that goes into the atmosphere, which is again composed of a lot of water. It's estimated that the amount of fresh water in the atmosphere is the same, if not more, than all of the rivers on Earth combined. Water vapor is the reason why our planet is kept warm to begin with. It's literally used for everything. Water is also used as a commodity in our day-to-day -day life. The average swimming pool needs about 22,000 gallons of water. In a single day, Americans use 18 million swimming pools worth of water. That's 400 billion gallons. 
One tiny little apple needs 18 gallons of water. A burger needs 660 gallons of water. A pound of chocolate needs over 3,000 gallons of water. For just seven pounds of chocolate, you could fill another swimming pool. But that's okay because there's a lot of water on planet Earth. The average American takes seven years to use the same amount of water that goes over Niagara Falls in a single second. Hydrologists estimate that there are 33 quadrillion gallons of water beneath your feet in groundwater, and the total amount of water on planet Earth is a staggering 326 quintillion gallons. And yet, even with that truly unfathomable amount of water, if every human being on Earth used the same amount of water as the average American or European does in a year, we would need three and a half planet Earth's worth of water. Our lifestyles are unsustainable. Just a third of the money used to pay for bottled water could pay for every project on Earth needed to give every human access to clean, drinkable water. And the real kicker in that equation is that the same price that you can get a bottle of water from a convenience store of 99 cents is the same cost as refilling a 500 milliliter bottle with tap water 1,740 times. Every day, 780 million people lack access to an improved water source. That's more than the population of Europe. Every hour, 200 children die due to exposure from unsafe drinking water. Every day, 200 million work hours are consumed by women walking to get water for their families. The average American uses 552 gallons of water a day, a hundred times greater than the average African family who use just five. Water is the most abundant resource on this planet. It's a natural miracle for which all life exists. As the universal solvent, it helps to distribute atoms of other molecules into a homogeneous, harmonious solution, the mechanism for which is the polarity of its chemical makeup. And despite the monumental quantities of water that we in the West have access to, it is poetically one of the most polarized resources on this planet. Despite its universal solvent properties to distribute particles evenly among its solution, it is so unevenly distributed on this planet among its users. Over the last century, water use has grown at a rate twice that of population increase. How can we fix it? By wasting less. Every year, a trillion gallons of water are wasted thanks to household leaks. That's the average annual usage of about 11 million American homes. A leaky tap that drips at just the rate of one drip every second over the course of a year will lose and waste about 3,000 gallons of water. That's almost twice the amount of the total water usage for a family in the developing world. By 2025, it's estimated that 1.8 billion people will experience a severe water shortage. By 2030, half the world's population. It's important to think about water, to share the thing responsible for your existence with the rest of the world, such that they can continue sharing the experience of existence. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really, really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, then you'd probably enjoy learning from all of the web pages and online documents that I used to source it, all of the links to which are in the description. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.